Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Q Pod. I'm John Furrier, Dave Vellante. We're breaking down all the stories every week. We have this podcast. We're on episode six, Dave. A lot of stuff going on. Trump got indicted. Elon Musk creates an astroturf uh, way to kind of get momentum to stop halt on AI development for six months. The internet broke and got crazy. Cryptocurrency banking. Uh, a lot of a lot of things going on in the world. It's been an amazing hundred days since ChatGPT. AI madness continues. This is our episode six, and we couldn't have a better time to do a podcast because breaking down all the action, and there's a ton of action this week, Dave. It's amazing to see. And again, I'm just still blown away. It's just in the past hundred days, so much has changed. The innovation pace on the AI madness is just incredible. More things to look at today. Uh, but the big the big story, Right out of the gate, I want to get into with you is this Elon Musk uh, signed uh, an open letter urging AI labs to to stop the training of their system of GPT-4. Basically, uh, and I'm but thousands of other signatures from an independent organization, um, not so independent as it's been reported as an astroturfing firm for Elon Musk. He invested in it. It's essentially creating fake momentum around something that doesn't even exist. So Really interesting. Now, Elon Musk was involved with OpenAI, tried to take over the company, and then got booted or left, so to speak. Basically, that's translation for big power play. He's out, and this effort was clearly a way for him to get in into the uh, the mud and and cause all kinds of trolling on OpenAI. And it's the stupidest thing I've ever seen. I got to say, and it was so public. Well, my first reaction was, oh, what's this? A competitor is trying to slow down open AI and, and, and Microsoft. And because it's going to have the opposite effect. It's like, don't look over there. And the people say, what? <laughs> you know, but, so for the people outside of tech who don't know what, you know, chat GPT is, now they're going to be poking around at it. You know, I, I was talking to Andy Tarai, who you know, he follows AI for, 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 uh, pretty closely. I asked him what his take was. He said, what happens after six months? And I thought that was right on. I mean, are other nations going to sign on for this? Or is this no, going to be like all, climate it's, change? It, it's, first of all, it's bullshit. First of all, it's the stupidest thing I've ever seen. So what is six <laughs> months going to do? All right, number one. Nothing. Number one. Number two, you got to get it out there and let the let the, let the things break a little bit, fix it. This is a clearly a generational shift. And also there's a competitive advantage for outside the United States. Remember, you got the Chinese and the Russians also trying totally. to weaponize chat, um, uh, AI as well. So, you know, this whole scare tactic of civilization is going to die, jobs are going to be risk, human humans are going to lose control to the machines. Um, it's actually intoxicating and fun to listen to that nonsense, but it is kind of sci-fi and kind of cool on one hand. But the reality is, is that this is so early on. I mean, misinformation is, is a legit point. We pointed that out on the pod. Um, that that's going to see a lot of misinformation with these tools. But with the misinformation, you're going to have solutions. This is the beginning of what I think is, again, the generational shift of new kinds of startups. Problems create opportunities and this kind of massive growth, the online population, okay, of AI users is going to look a lot like the internet online population when the browser hit. You pointed this out on the, a couple of pods ago that the, the dot-com bubble, this is a key metric. I talked to like at least 10 entrepreneurs this week doing AI startups, Dave, and they all pointed to the same thing. And I said, the number one metric is this market is growing and the, the KPI is the number of online users. There's a massive surge. This is for everybody. And you're seeing the numbers. So I think the next six months are going to be probably more of a high velocity than ever before. And the fact that the Elon Musk and the competitors to open AI are trying to slow it down is clearly obvious. This is a, a blatant attempt to slow down the competition. I mean, I, you're right on. I mean, the use cases are amazing. You're at you're at parties. People never heard of this. You go, what, what do you do for a living? And you can show them how they could use chat GPT. They're like blown away. <laughs> they like Their eyes like light up. I, I mean, I do agree that if you're going to ask a chat GPT to write code to take over a computer and, you know, create havoc. You obviously want to control that, but you can't stifle innovation. You can't protect the the past from the future. Right? Well, we're and, reporting on Silicon Angle today, breaking news. Italy's private regulator temporary bans chat GPT and probes open AI claiming the company has no legal basis for mass collection and storage of personal data. So they're banning it out of fear and they're playing the privacy card. Well, we know that 
essentially open AI is strip mining the web basically. Yeah. And <laughs> so that that's happening. So it's, it's really the web. So, I mean, I don't, so China, I mean, Italy bans it again. This is the, this year people are scared. They don't they, they want to kill it. They don't understand. And then that's classic early adopter market day where you have people that just are uncomfortable well, with the possibilities of AI, like this, some sort of corner, dark corner that's going to turn and kill people, take away jobs, kill civilization, start a Skynet, you know, Terminator kind of vibe going on for the folks under the age of 30. Probably don't know what Terminator is, but Skynet take over the world. <laughs> but it's funny, John, <laughs> right? Because, you know, in the early days of tech, the governments would be like, you know, they'd literally be like two decades behind. And then they'd say, oh, wow, we got to look into this. And then, you know, but that time frame has been compressing. And now it's like they're right there. But like last week, we talked about with the, the congressman asking or the senator asking, does TikTok run on Wi-Fi? It's like, OK, so they're now compressed the time frame. But th the governments, they don't really know what they're doing and they don't really have good answers. And then it becomes political. Yeah. And then the whole thing is well, going to get the one angle that's up. interesting from the privacy. China, Italy by banning Italy, banning it using the privacy card, I think is kind of just a. Um, Kind of a false flag in my mind, but the the thing that's going to be interesting to not just privacy is copyright. Think about what copyright infringement is going to look like with all these tools. How do you source the origination? What's the fraud detection? Um, this week, I had a chance to see Terry Wise, who came out of retirement from AWS, um, with another Cube alumni, Rick Farnell. They're running a company doing essentially a product that's essentially identifies fraud and or you know, people reselling in gray markets that they shouldn't be. So, you know, this is going to open up a content and uh, copyright problem. Huge. How long, how long do you think, so go back to this proposal, this, this like ridiculous proposal, how long would it take? Forget the, forget the industry, you know, because we know how long industry consortia take. How long would it take the government to figure out how to put guardrails on this and then implement them? And then, okay. I don't know, would the industry take longer? Probably just as much time. You're not going to ever build a consensus around this. So it's, look at it, it's not an easy answer, uh, but I think, I think education is part of it. I think tools, I think there are tools that can, you know, like you, you I think you were telling me one of the pods that you can sniff out, you know, chat GPT signatures. Okay, so maybe tooling to protect people. But if you're going to have like a, try to build a consensus from industry or government, Forget it. What a waste of time that is. Well, the innovation is massive. I'm on Twitter right now, and this guy, Lance Martin, who was a PhD uh, grad from Stanford, basically wrote an open source thing using Chainlang AI, one of the tools, Chain, Chainlang and Haystack, the two ones. He essentially built via G Chat, G Chat GPT-4 API, sucked in the, po the top podcasts, uh, Lex Friedman and the All In podcast. And I'm talking to him about doing our podcast and all of our 15,000 Cube interviews. He's got a utility where it answers questions, you know, you know, what does someone think about this? What's the best investment? It's going through the corpus of the podcasts. The multimodal thing is happening. Dave. Audio is becoming Q and a like Quora almost or chatbot. Audio is becoming data and video is becoming metadata. I mean, this is really amazing. So, I mean, he just got put it on open source. So it's all open source. It's this is again going to be a surge, and now this open source's role in this is going to be interesting to watch. It's going to make social media fake news look like child's play. Um, yeah. You know, on the other hand, maybe people just kind of won't won't trust it, and they'll maybe maybe there's maybe there's a silver lining here, John. I mean, how many times have people texted you something and said, "Look at this, man," and it's the, you know their agenda, <laughs> and you're like, dude. That is fake. And, yeah. and they're like, oh, sorry. There's, so, well, that's why I brought up that firm that, that um, Rick Farnell and Terry Rise are running right, right now. They take a, basically a digital protection, digital brand protection company, and they're turning it into a cyber and or verification process. There will be a, you know, AI approved seal of approval, like a good housekeeping or like good better business bureau or, you know, this red meat is real or that kind of thing. So, you know, I think you're going to start to see the validators coming in and bots for bots and you know, compilers for compilers, code for code. That you know, you're going to see AI as code 
be that AI first kind of wave coming. And everything points to that. You're seeing, you're seeing, um, you know, the, everyone going crazy over the plugin for chat GPT. Um, some are calling it the uh, marketplace that their Apple store. Well, first of all, it's, it's more like a Chrome extension, in my opinion, not even close to an Apple store vibe. But sure. but chat GPT is an app. It's not, it's a platform. It's a super cloud and a super app, Dave. So wait, so before I go there, so wait, you're saying that there's going to be tooling to help adjudicate this? Oh, you mean the market's going to figure it out, not the government? Wow, what a great <laughs> hey, idea. I think it was your first rant on our first <laughs> inaugural pod, wasn't it? We were going crazy on the government. Never let the government touch anything. Um, but, you know, there's, there's that too, right? So the whole TikTok thing went down. Um, other breaking news real quick while we're at the top here. Twitter is open sourcing portion of its Git code on GitHub including its algorithm for recommending tweets um, for you, which is the new tab, but excluding its ad recommendation engine. Now this week, Twitter had some source code leaked and they also changed the terms of the fire hose. Now that's inside baseball, but that's not going well. <laughs> so <laughs> maybe our bet that uh, Twitter was going to take over for TikTok might not work. Elon, we gave you all the advice if you're listening. But I think, Dave, it's not going to, if TikTok gets banned, which was another thing this week that happened, we talked about it, I think Amazon would be better off taking it over. They have more e-commerce, um, affiliate linking. TikTok is growing and the revenues are coming out of TikTok are significant. People are getting massive traffic and the commerce on TikTok with those numbers are creator centric. So I think the angle is not Twitter, it's Amazon taking over <laughs> The TikTok. Well, not an Oracle. What's your reaction? So, not Oracle. So, John, I, I got to <laughs> make it up. So, I was talking to my daughter last night. You know, she's big on TikTok and Insta, blah, blah, blah. And she said to me, she got really emotional. She goes, My generation is incessantly reaching out to, to lawmakers and, and inundating them you know, with our <laughs> point of view. We are not going to let this happen. And so, Anyway, I think you were right on. You said, look, just sell it to a US-based company. A bike dance might not want to do that. Just make them do it. And uh, yeah, Amazon, that's interesting. But yeah, some kind of reputable firm. <laughs> Again, Oracle was sort of thrown around. So why not? You oh, know, they're so they're... trustworthy. You know, I mean, they are. You know, and and right? they got the engineered systems. They definitely got the security, no doubt about it. But the question yeah, is, I mean... the question is what what happens next? And and it's going to be interesting around TikTok. The bill that they put together was basically a surveillance society. And you know my rant. I'm going to save it for the rant section. But you can't have a free country and freedom and liberty if you're under surveillance all the time. That's not freedom. That's called China. And so if China causes the U.S. to become China, then they've won. So when we lose. So the question is, what does freedom mean if you yeah. have to be surveilled all the time? Now, I think the younger generation is, doesn't understand the impact of the surveillance and the malware. But yeah, I agree. Me. They don't care. They don't They don't care. Or, yeah, and, and the potential to, to manipulate the data to, to cause harm to the, the United States and society. I mean, we've, we've seen that in social media. So you're right about that, but that's why, you know, the, but the problem is, John, the government, they just can't make decisions. All that was, that Senate hearing was just a bunch of grandstanding to say who's tougher on China. And now there's, now that the Gen X and millennials have, have, have spammed Congress, they're, you know, the Democrats are flipping, the Republicans are saying, hey, there's an opportunity for us to look harder on China. It just becomes so political. Nobody cares about like what's good for the country. And I think, you know, you and I, I think came up with the right decision. Make ByteDance sell the majority of the company to a U.S.-based, you know, entity, and govern it accordingly. <laughs> Boom, done. So, yeah. Well, AI madness continues, Dave, and and I think it's going to be one of those things that, that um, just if you look in the past hundred days, I said this at the top. It's been pretty brutal how fast just our interview. I did an interview with the CEO of Hugging Face just like a month and a yeah, half ago. Right. Okay. And look how fast that market's changing for the better for them. So I think, you know, I'm really excited by the AI movement. I'm not afraid of it at all. I think the ban is nonsense. It's politically motivated, competitively charged, and it's all, basically it's astroturfing. The got Google's are, attention. Got school, well, right? It got, well, classic, a, a classic fake operation to give momentum to a non-issue, make it appear like there's momentum against it. There's this 
and everyone's walking back their statements a day and a half later, Dave. I know. Like, you know, like, oh shit, they got bamboozled. Oops. Maybe oh, I should got... sign that. <laughs> <laughs> and then, and then this week you got uh, crypto madness. So AI continue. We're going to pound this all all year. I think we're going to be digging into AI. But you know, you also brought up on the first podcast that bullish on crypto. You know, I am too. But you know, how I feel about the the that whole coin shit coin business. But but and the, and the fraud. But the Binance CEO got sued on compliance. And then yeah. in China, all the China banks went to Hong Kong and are offering a safe harbor for crypto companies. And now today, people are having a hard time converting their crypto. So what's your take on this? Because this also is China setting up in Hong Kong. What's the international banking system look like? What's the role of the United States? It's clearly the United States is clamping down on all crypto activity uh, to get rain it in, rain in the chaos, as we say. What's and your you take saw, on this? You saw, and you saw just to add to the news, the Nvidia CTO basically said that crypto has nothing useful to to, to add. It's nothing useful to society, right? And, and they shifted, Michael, right? What's his name? Michael uh, Kagan. Michael Kagan, right? And they shifted yeah. their supply toward AI at the expense of of crypto. And okay, so he says adds nothing useful to society. It will need a lot of financial products that are simply designed to. Make more yeah. money for New Yorkers with homes in the Hamptons, like crappy well, baskets Hamptons of mortgage-backed and, securities. And, and Miami you know? now too. They're all they Miami, call it right. West Palm Beach, the New York City of the South. Um, the Kagan so, guy, though, Dave, this is interesting. And I remember you and I had a conversation on the Cube. It's at VM World, I think five years ago or something, maybe 2018, 2017. We asked Pat Gelsinger at that time, the CEO of VMware, what he thought about crypto, and he was right right out of the gate. I thought I think it's bullshit because the sustainability angle. Remember that interview? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. But so this is what this guy's coming from. He's saying the crypto mining is problematic. Now I think it's just like fashion. The wind's blowing against crypto. AI is the hot thing. Obviously, AI and and GPUs are go great together. So you know, Nvidia wins on either wave. I know, but but you know, come on. Come there's, on. There's arguments on the other side, like the whole move to proof of stake. There's a lot of things that, that that consume energy, so I don't think we can. I think it's I think it's a bullshit crypto. statement. What are you? I think it's bullshit that he said that. I think it's. I was I I totally disagree with him. I'm like, it, first of all, it, the banking crisis to me, the most recent banking crisis, is a case for Bitcoin. I mean, hello. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> exactly. Now, now you mentioned the Binance thing. I don't think that looks so good for Binance, to be honest with you. So I, I I'll tell you my personal story. So I have, I've I've had a Binance account for a long, long time. And then what happened is when the U.S. cracked down, Binance customers were told, you got to move all your crypto out of Binance into U.S. Binance because you're not going to be able to access your crypto anymore. And I never did it. I just left it in there. Yeah. And when I, when, I, when I would travel overseas, I would check it out. And then I said, oh, I can just use a VPN. So I went in on a VPN. Well, so they, they got the CEO, I think, of the company saying, oh, wait, hey, we have this big Chicago, you know, options trader or whatever, whoever it was, and they're a big account and, and saying, hey, just make sure they use a VPN. So they've got that on email. So <laughs> really bad. And then the other thing is, so I went in the other day, VPN no longer works. They get a message up, they you know sniff out, they figure out, it's not that hard to figure out you're still in the US, even though you're on a VPN. They're like, oh no, you're in the US. So they, they but it does not look good for those guys. And you know what? Hey, if they're breaking the law, they should be slapped. I mean, I'm all for that. I just, you know, I'm down on the government meddling, but if people are yeah, breaking, it, companies are breaking the law. I mean, what does that even mean? I mean, inter is this is an international issue. I've, when you see these big trends, there's always a rock on the river that causes the water to stop. Someone puts a blocker up, but the force is going to move around of all this. In my opinion, you can't hold back the AI wave. You can't hold back the crypto blockchain wave. That's critical infrastructure, Dave. We've been riffing on this for years. And yeah, there's a little bit of a, you know, shit layer of shit coins up there, whatever, that's got a little bit bubbly and, you know, shit happens when it's like that. So reigning in the chaos is what's happening right now. Let the chaos reign, reign in the chaos. So I think, and you, I think you believe this, the infrastructure aspect of blockchain token economics is completely legit. Absolutely. Opportunity, opportunity from an infrastructure standpoint. The key will be applications, what is on there. So what we've been seeing with super cloud and super apps and abstraction layers, you're still going to see a different kind of paradigm on 
um, blockchain. And that's going to be really where the opp opportunity is. And what sucks about the, the crypto winter that's going on is it was so fraudulent that this could put a year damper on it. And that's why I said in the first pod, our inaugural podcast, that the alpha engineers are moving to AI. And it's clearly the case, as I pointed out on Twitter, you got PhDs from Stanford universities, Cal, I wear my Cal shirt for the data guys and uh, the story you wrote that was flying all around the internet. You got kids at Berkeley, all computer science programs getting their attention on this. So that's bad for crypto. So, uh, however, the the big money people, the long game folks are in crypto still. So I don't think it's going to go away. It's just going to be kind of quiet for a little bit. But the, the smart money and the long players are all in on crypto still. It's just that the I worry I worry about the entrepreneurial energy. I really do. So I, uh, you know I'm watching that here, I, and it seems to be. I worry about down. it too, John. I mean, because you and I know we we've, we've met a lot of people who were mission driven, doing some really interesting work you know, taking a lot of risk and, you know, who knows, rolling the dice, a lot of stuff. Forget putting aside the, the, the fraudulent stuff. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about, you know, genuine innovation, trying to solve things like DeFi, trying to solve, you know, security, uh, using crypto and, and, and blockchain. And those are all good things. And I'm still a believer. I, I still believe in the fundamental premise that, you know, in the early days, if you wanted to invest in, in Linux, you couldn't, yeah. and crypto gives you a way to do that. And that was an awesome funding mechanism. And yeah, it got a lot of fraud, but I still, again, I come back to the banking crisis. It basically, to me, was a commercial yeah. for Bitcoin. You know, gold and 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 Bitcoin. Yeah, <laughs> you know? and, and and a case and, and a case for what we know it is. It intermediate. It just intermediates the middleman. So, I mean, you couldn't paint a better poster child for innovation with blockchain and what's just happened with the banking crisis. In fact, even though I'm kind of seeing the developer engineering alphas go to AI, I got a text this week or a DM on, on Instagram from a very senior, but yet young in his prime, but not super old, entrepreneur, um, ex-executive at a big company, one of the big five everyone knows, who's super smart. And he's all into crypto in terms of the shift. Um, not from a money-making standpoint on trading crypto, because there's a, a lot of people did that for a year, you know, they were trading crypto. This is a legitimate entrepreneur who's uh, sees opportunity recognition in crypto as a structural change. That's a, that's a tell sign, Dave. There's going to be more long game here. So, you know, I, I don't know. I just don't know if it's going to be a year or two. I, I said two on, my first, on our first podcast. Yeah, I mean that's a bit. I, I I had predicted this. I said, look, this thing's going to top out. I can't tell you exactly when, but it's probably going to be within the next six months. Sure enough, it did. And then, and I will say this: it's going to go sideways. And I think it could go sideways for two or three years. But my prediction is that you know, I think Bitcoin's going to go to a hundred grand. I can't tell you when. Others have have predicted. I think Kathy Wood said it's going to go to a million. I didn't make. <laughs> that prediction but i think it's going to go up and then it's going to you know come down and it's going to be pretty volatile for quite some time until well, it does get more regulated but i and i think those guy, government guidelines would be a good thing for for the crypto business i don't think they would necessarily be a bad thing but you know i i think the premise still stands that that the government just prints money like crazy satoshi whoever he or she was satoshi said I'm going to create something that you just can't do quantitative easing. Well, we know Here Satoshi is female, right? Right. Well, I, that's, <laughs> that's, what the, that's what your T-shirt says, right? Uh, so, and that that was, you know, genius and brilliant, started a movement. And um, look, I, if, you know, the other the other tell, you look at that, I, I love the debt clock. I love it and I hate it. It makes me cry. But crypto uh, as a percentage of, Crypto divided by the M2 money supply is now, I want to say, 19. The, the ratio was like 19%. It was 2,300 back in 2013. And so that gap is closing. And so crypto is becoming a, you know, it's still small, but it's becoming a bigger and more important piece of the overall economy. Here, I'll look that up while you respond. Yeah, I, I think I think we're in, I mean, I think there's, I think there's a cyber war going on, as you know, I'm into that whole theory. We've got to red, move that red line down. Um, and 17. So here's the ratio. It was the so crypto, the dollar to crypto ratio 
uh, meaning the 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 valuation of crypto divided by the M2 money supply was was uh, other way around rather was nine thousand four hundred eighty nine to one in twenty thirteen. <laughs> it's now seventeen to one. Okay, so that says crypto, you know, continues to. That's something that is worth watching, and and I think that there's. It's legitimate. There's not just, I mean, a Warren Buffett, you know, says no and Charlie Munger and so many naysayers, but you know, that, that's just because they're smart and rich doesn't mean they're right. Well, today is a day where people are freaking out in the U S because of the Donald Trump indictment, the half the country celebrating the other half is revolting. Oh boy. Um, so that's news and that we has to be addressed, Dave. I mean, like, I just think that, you know, if people go down the civil war route, which I predicted years ago, by the way, um, decade ago, um, I think about it, people got to chill out. I mean, the Republicans are going too far here. And they just got to say, look at Trump. Don't even, just don't even throw your hat in the ring. Just step aside. Republican Party is, they're stuck. And the Democrats, you know, they, they got Biden, he's a puppet. And so, you know, you got you get a lot of different kind of views. It's, it's, a, it's a terrible party makeup on both sides. So it's going to be interesting. This is a pivotal election because you want to see new leadership come out of this, not same old, same old. So, you know, I hate to see that Trump's coming back in to to, um, to uh, throw his ring and hat in the ring. I think it helps um, him. I do. I uh, think it helps him, John. I, I don't like it. I, I don't. I mean, I, I, you know what I think about, about Trump. I mean, like, many of his policies I agree with. I don't agree with the man and I, I can't get by January 6th. I'm sorry. You know, it's a peaceful transfer of power. You try to stop it. So yeah. Eh, yeah. you're out, you're dead to me in that, in yeah. that environment. So, but, but I think this is bad because I think it emboldens him. First of all, pe people who are against Trump, then this is not going to change anything. People who are for Trump, this is just going to deepen their affinity yeah. There's no, to him. No, so good, I, I no, no good comes out of it. I just, it's so, I agree. it's so bad. What's the outcome? So let's, uh, what is the outcome that's good uh, out of this? I, I don't well, get it. Th there's a lot of <laughs> headlines. Lindsey Graham suggests Trump punch a cop on the way to Tuesday's arraignment. Now that's really smart, right? That's the shit that's going down. People are blowing their, like pretty much crying over that Fox News. Um, Jim Jordan's freaking out. All the Trumpies are all like, you know, this is their, but they're done to die on this hill, you know? And so it's just, he's, he should be a footnote. He should have been a footnote. And he never should have threw his name into the hat and ring. You know, there's the Republican parties are blowing the middle. They have the middle opportunity to take the moderate and to, to right. And they go the other way. They go to the fringe. It's just terrible. I just think it's so bad for the country. And people, if people don't chill out and let the air out of the balloon slowly, it's going to pop and it's going to be a tinderbox. So I just don't think it's healthy, Dave. And this is just, by the way, that situation, the stuff we've been talking about, the cyber warfare, the geopolitical landscape, the current banking system. I mean, it's hell in a handbasket right now. So like um, it's, it's, it's a lot going on. So yeah, it's, like I said, this is going to support my thesis that a revolution is coming and the younger generation should step up like your daughter who's saying, Hey, you know what? You know, we're, we're, we're against this old thinking. So how about both parties come up with better candidates or maybe there's an independent candidate that could come out <laughs> Right. I mean, yeah, you know, I mean, Pre President Biden is, is he's getting up there. Right. I mean, he's kind of old. I think he's vulnerable. You know, he's he very high probability. He could be a one term president. So I don't know. Maybe that's why Trump figures, OK, hey, I can win. Even if I have a criminal record, I can still evidently you could still be president with a criminal record. But you can't be president if you weren't born here. <laughs> Charlie <laughs> Senate's kid, who's awesome, is you know, he's American as apple pie, but he was actually born in the UK and he's, he's wants to be a politician, but he can't be, he can't be president. So he wants to run for Senate so he can change the law and become president. I mean, I don't know. Whatever. Hey, they changed MLB baseball this week, Dave. They got a clock and they got bigger bases. I mean, change. Oh my God. Have you seen that? It really hasn't changed anything. Has it? I think, I think they should just have put, put baseball on a time clock three, Three hours and the game ends. Seven run rule. Seven run or, rule. You know, three, yeah, something like that. <laughs> Just end it. <laughs> Yankees game. Yankees Red Sox games are four hours. No, easy. You know, it's more. Like, it's four and a half or five. Yeah. I mean, I think you know every other sport said, "Hey, let's juice offense. It'll be awesome." But they have a clock. 
baseball tries to do that. You know, hey, bring back steroids and forget it. The game would be six hours long. Uh, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm serious. They should have a coin toss to see who bats first and then make the game three hours. If it goes three innings or two and a half, four yeah. and a half, it's over. Yeah. Go yeah. home. Yeah, that, and that's that's actually one way to do it. But the other thing about the the, the pitching clock that is the is the pitchers going to get injured, the injuries to pitchers. It's going to be an offensive game because they have to work fast, and so you're going to see more injuries uh, and more pitches that'll be hit harder. So I think the numbers are going to go through the roof on the offense with the that change. The batter should be more strict on the on getting in the box faster. There's no excuse for you know stepping out for like ten seconds. You're in the box. You should stay in the box unless you have an injury or something. Stay in the box, put one foot out like the old days. That's the it. Pro the problem with baseball is the more offense, the longer the game. Yeah. And, and, and it's just the opposite. It doesn't matter if you have a clock in hockey or basketball or football, whatever it is. The game ends when it ends. I and do so like the rule. I do like the rule of the shift, taking that shift away. That is so sucky. I mean, four outfielders. And right I field. agree. It was always so frustrated with Big Poppy would, you know, rip one to – you know the the hole, and there's a there's the guy in right field. <laughs> there's four him. players in, <laughs> All right. in, in his vicinity, <laughs> but that means more offense. You know, I'd like to see. A, I, I, you know, they tightened up the strike zone. I'd like to see a wider strike zone. How about the Bruins? Uh, Notice the Bruins jersey in the background here. I got my Bruins hat in the background here. How about um, those Bruins? You think they, they peaked early this year? You think they're going to go all the way? They made a run. I mean, they're good. I, I, but, you know, it's the jinx, right? Anybody who wins the President's Cup, which you just clinched last night in overtime, uh, they just – they never win the Cup. Right? They always <laughs> flame out in the first or second round. Yeah, remember um, the Patriots were all undefeated that year, and the Giants, the big catch on the helmet catch, you know, that, that season went up in smoke. So, you know, I always get nervous if you're, if you're peaking. If you're not peaking in the playoffs or, or you're the favorite team, unless you're absolutely – rolling over everybody. Um, but I think that they made the good trades. I mean, look at 12 losses. I know. Okay. I mean, unbelievable. And then the big surprise too on the West was the Kraken. You know, they had a pretty decent season, 41 and 25. They beat yeah, the Bruins Andy. at the Garden. <laughs> I know. That's Andy Jassy's team. I know. He's a and Rangers he, fan, by the way. So it's I always text him whenever the Kraken are playing and Bruins. I'm like, are you Ranger for the Rangers or the Kraken? That's an easy choice when you're an owner. Yeah. <laughs> That's like no, a he's kid. Got, you know? Exactly. Yeah. It's like me with but, the, uh, I mean, me with I'm the not, I mean, I I love hockey. You're a hockey guy, but that, doesn't it come down to goaltending? Whatever goaltender gets hot in the playoff That's the, wins? It's absolutely the case. Goaltender makes the difference. Absolutely. Yeah. All right, Dave. So we got uh, we're cranking through um let's take a break and come back to that next segment after the short promotion from about rsa conference that we were running right. so we'll be right back hello everyone from april 24th to april 27th the global cybersecurity community will gather at rsa conference 2023 on the agenda is arming you with the best practices and state-of-the-art solutions to keep your organization secure and safe Experience the countless opportunities to make valuable connections that can open up new doors. Access cybersecurity's biggest innovations and cutting edge ideas during the four days of sessions, keynotes, skill building experiences, and more. Don't miss the chance to be stronger together. Visit rsaconference.com slash thecube23 to learn more and register and tell them John and Dave sent you. rsaconference.com slash thecube23. Let's get into the next block. Um, okay. I'll see we hit the hard news, AI madness, Trump indictment, people going crazy. We talked about the crypto winter and how that we see that happening. Let's talk about um, our wheelhouse, which is enterprise. We're seeing a ton of enterprise action. You wrote a killer post two weeks ago now about Databricks and their opportunity. They've since launched Dolly, which is a chat GPT. They're all over the AI. I just saw Ollie on a panel. Um, I hear Databricks is doing extremely well financially. You think they got some, some potential headwinds if they don't make the right moves. I thought your piece was phenomenal. It's like it's everyone's talking about it except for Databricks. Not one from Databricks called me up at all, but it's been high traffic, high discussion. You hit a nerve there with the Databricks uh, well, story. I think, you know, if you look at Databricks portfolio, um, they've, they've got people coming after them from all angles. As you well know, they Spark kind of changed the whole Hadoop landscape. 
and they bet their business on Spark. And now there's, you know, kind of new trends occurring, whether it's, you know, semantic layers, whether it's generative models that, you know, could threaten them. So I, I feel as though that they've got enough momentum and enough smarts that they can make, you know, the right, whether it's M&A or rewriting their platform, et cetera, that they're going to they're going to do very well. I know George Gilbert is you know, less sanguine than I am, but I'll tell you this, John, the data from the ETR data, Databricks is really, really strong right now. And then last week we wrote which tech firms are most exposed to the banking crisis. And I'll tell you, here's my list. I mean, Splunk sort of came out as the most exposed from a negative standpoint, Zoom, DocuSign, Dynatrace, SailPoint, Informatica, and Qualys were kind of jumped off the chart. Workday and, and Databricks from a positive standpoint, it's like what banking crisis and Databricks in particular, like huge momentum inside of financial services. And my thinking is financial services companies are more sophisticated. Databricks appeals to more sophisticated companies that want to do heavy data science. And so they could, they have an appetite for that. I, I was just shocked at the momentum they have there and everything suggests that in the field, they've got tremendous momentum. Remember, they were relying on Microsoft for their go-to-market early on. Mm -hmm. And then Microsoft, you know, has kind of shifted to some of their own tooling. And now I thought Dolly was was brilliant because that's one of the threats to, 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 to Databricks is their AI tool chain could get disrupted by generative AI. So they're like, hey, we got generative AI, we're going to open source it. <laughs> that was a good move by them. Well, I got to tell you, it was a great story. And what got me focused on was one's a private company, Databricks, one, the other company, Snowflake, is public. Snowflake is out in the open. They're at the top of the charts on enterprise value the next 12 months revenue, 14.7x. There, and then you got Cloudflare, obviously kicking ass. Um, Datadog, ServiceNow, MongoDB, CrowdStrike still in the top 10 doing well. This these business models are interesting. So Databricks is private. So we don't know the valuation. We don't know some of their metrics. What's your sense? Because I've been digging at this for over two weeks and around Databricks' numbers, talking to everyone I can, trying to get some inside information. And what I've discovered, again, my synthesis, my dots connecting, is that Databricks is doing extremely well, Dave, financially. Yeah, and, they are. And what's your, what, you, what are you reading? So so the, the, to the topic of today's breaking analysis, which we'll publish tomorrow, was I had a, a hedge fund manager on and she had the premise that, look, she's been buying semis. And semis have been rocking lately. You know, year to date, they're up. NVIDIA's up like 90%. AMD's up. The, the, the semiconductor indices are, are, are all up. Uh, but enterprise software is not. Snowflake's down, you know, significantly. Zscaler's Z down, although some, some, some uh, uh, cyber companies like CrowdStrike and Palo Alto are, are, are doing pretty well. Um, but there's a real divergence between semiconductors and enterprise software. Mm -hmm. And so... That can't be overlooked. You got to start saying, is our semiconductors a leading indicator? Now, as it, as it relates to, to Snowflake and, and Databricks, she, she shared some data from Battery Ventures. You got the cloud, this is calendar year 23 growth. You got the cloud providers collectively growing at 20%. I got them at 21%. So that maps Snowflake, uh, this is calendar year 23. Snowflake 40%, Cloud Fit Flare 37, CrowdStrike 34, you know, kind of down the list. The aggregate, Mongo 16, the aggregate average of all those kind of cloud companies, enterprise software companies, 28%. So well down from what we thought in the pandemic. So if, if Snowflake's growing at 40% in the calendar year, I, I would guess, and they're, you know, I would guess that the Databricks is growing, you know, significantly faster than that because they're smaller. They're probably half the size of Snowflake. Yeah. So they are kicking ass. What's the market, cap, no what's the market cap of Snowflake right now? I want to say 30. I'll just, let me search it. 30 right. billion snow stock. Let me see. 30, 40 billion. Let me see here. 49 oh, 50 billion. billion. 50 billion. 50 yeah. billion. So. I mean, Databricks has got upside. Even though if if they reset their, I think their last valuation was 30 something billion. Yeah, it was. And so uh, if this is say hypothetically that they cut that down to say 20 billion, we're picking a number, 25 billion. Yep. 20 to 25 billion. If they do, any additional financing that's private, they have huge upside if Snowflake's the proxy, if their numbers are the same as Snowflake, which I think they are in terms of like momentum. Um, 
you know, as you know, you know, the margin hits are going to be, or, or the free cash flow is not the real metric. It's enterprise value over the next 12 months is the, the top metric right now, which is ask companies. So here's the question. Databricks has got upside. They just announced Dolly. What's Let's discuss the angle of um, AI impact, Dave, to, to margins. How does the SaaS business model impact these companies? Because you know, there's going to be companies like Databricks and Snowflakes. If, and, and the way Ollie's talking publicly, he's got that little smirk. He's got that, you know, smirk where he's like, you know, something we don't. Um, and I think it's machine learning. I think they got a lot of action going on there. Um, that's my guess. Again, no outside information, just my assumption. If they got AI as a tailwind to help their margins, they could be freaking profitable. How yeah, do you think, see that happening? Well, first of all, I think that people are going to, most companies are going to acquire, buy AI, AI through their SaaS vendor. That's the, the most logical way to get it. So I think to answer your question, those SaaS companies that can take advantage of AI are going to be in a better position. I, I wrote recently about RPA. Is, it, is, is RPA going to be you know, consumed by generative AI? And I think the answer is some will, the point tools will. And then, you know, can a UI path actually turn a, a generative AI into a tailwind? You know, their CEO, Daniel Denae said, hey, we've been working on, on, on generative AI and large language models for a long, long time. And, and they're going to actually simplify the adoption of our products. And that means that our customers are going to be able to drive more yeah. productivity. And so it's that, you know, work backwards from the customer. As the customer applies AI and has an ROI on their business, that's going to be, uh, that's going to drag along those companies, those yeah. technology companies that are best positioned to provide that. So. Yeah, I think the SaaS business model is going to continue to thrive. And I think specifically why I like the AI injection is in this capital markets where there's not a lot of IPOs going on and or, you know, big finance, unless you're like a Databricks or someone like that. This, the free cash flow is not a big metric because they are funded. But under squeeze like this, where the capital markets are tight, you got to do more with less. The classic, you know, make you know the the memos that go around. Oh yeah, runway. If you can get AI to help generate higher margins and free cash flow, you're basically eliminating those key parts that are costly, right? So I think AI might actually turbocharge the SaaS businesses by margin expansion and free cash flow, which is typically a mature out later out in the in the execution of a startup going public. I mean, they throw losses for as long as they can, but they got plenty of capital. I, that, I do. That is that is a great opportunity. If I'm a CEO of a SaaS company, I'm refactoring with AI immediately. Oh yeah. Oh, and, they, and, and I think the smart ones are. I, I and I do. By the way, I do think free cash flow matters a lot. And I think there are companies that have inherent profitability are turning the knob so that they can show free cash flow. And I, I would agree with you. I think that, that that SaaS is the way that a lot of companies are going to consume AI. And, and I do think. I do by think the way, there Snowf is this... By the way, Snowflake's free cash flow margin is 25. percent Most are negative. Yes, right, and and remember, uh, their their last quarter is is uh, uh, seasonality is very high for free cash flow, so they'll probably end up being you know I don't know I, I don't forget the exact numbers I have to look it up, but it's you know single digit kind of free cash flow, or maybe they maybe even a little bit higher, but it, it's not as high as twenty five percent. But last quarter was, um, I I do think that there's um, there's a lot to be said for companies that are doing this, that the semantic layer and the next generation of data apps. So we're moving from a world that is, and I let's talk about the this, this notion that is very app centric, where all the data lives inside of the app. Right now that's the SaaS and it's it's locked inside of that. I was on a, a, a call with the CIO yesterday and she was saying, that's the one big thing that sort of has this concern is that we've got all our data lives inside of the apps and we're, you know the, the SaaS apps. So we got to bring it back into our data repository. We have to really care, be careful about our IP, but we're shifting to a world that's data centric, meaning that the, the, the data um, doesn't sit inside of the logic, the logic sits inside of the data. So yeah. you have companies like uh, DBT Labs that are API-ifying API the metrics inside of a data warehouse. You got companies like AtScale, Chris Lynch's company, that are that are that built out over the last decade this semantic layer, which is really hard to do. Um, and that's going to be sort of the next big trend in data analytics and then beyond into data apps. Now, I can't really say when that's going to have an impact, but I think it's very clear that what companies want is they want, they want like Uber, they want yeah. a digital representation of their business. 
drivers, riders, destinations, ETAs. Those are all data elements that have coherence and they can talk to each other. You can't do that in business today. So essentially a digital twin of your business, people, process, places, things that you can then accelerate and monetize. Yeah, and I think having that data unlocked is critical. The thing that gets my attention on the M LL LLMs, large language models and all the foundational models is the applications are coming on. It's very consumer-like. And that's what uh, we saw in the conversation around the plugin for OpenAI is that the online population of AI users is going to exponentially grow. So think about that for a minute. I mean, look at just the fact that ChatGPT is out there, it gives everyone the awareness that it's for them. So it's a consumer dynamic, what it is. And so, but developers are now just on board. So you're seeing a massive picks and shovels business for the gold rush that is AI around tooling, data unlocking, as you're pointing out, the semantic layer. You're seeing um, new, new tools for um, multimodal data, different types of data working together. Um, this is like a significant mind shift from classic development. So I think there's a movement going on where you're going to see massive IaaS past like things around how to stand up infrastructure and platforms for managing this AI stuff. So I think that's going to be an opportunity, Dave. And, and the question is, is that what does that mean for the mo momentum that was just six months ago or more a year ago? the data mesh layer. So like you have, so, so the question Bingo. is, you know, it's, it's like, right okay, on. what, what happens? Like, because we had momentum with the data mesh, you got the edge that you're pointing out data within data. It makes sense at the edge. You got massive compute, which by the way, is allowing all these developers to do all this large language models, AI stuff. So, so it's like, we're coming into a, uh, a science project of things colliding together at the same time, different data sets, large data sets, small data sets, open source, proprietary, GPU, bolt-on abstraction layer. I mean, it's pretty intense. Yeah, and so we are seeing this massive distributed system build out. We're democratizing data. AI is going to accelerate that data democratization. What does that mean? It means get, a biz get the data in the hands of a business person so that he or she doesn't have to wait days, weeks, months, whatever, to get data out of the data pipeline. And so this is where the kind of the super cloud, if you will, comes in. And, and AI is playing a huge role in that. So you need a couple of things there. Uh, this tech, a lot of tech obviously, but two big things are self-serve infrastructure. And you've pointed out data infrastructure is one of the hottest things going right now. And then you have to, if you're going to distribute data, you have to have governance. You have to have automated computational governance. And that's where AI is going to play a huge role and making sure that, that the person who has access to the data is the right person, that if you're going to share data, that it's governed and it's secure, that's a very challenging problem when you talk about yeah. a mesh. And, and then the next question is, okay, business model. Open AI is challenged already on this. Actually, we, we predicted on theCUBE, I forget whether it was our first podcast, we predicted that Google wouldn't launch their their thing. If they did, it would be a separate company because of the backlash, which we're already seeing the backlash happen. But that being said, if if people go to the AI day, what happens to that data layer? What's the business model? Should they charge for it? If it's a revolution, are you too commercially minded for it? Is it is it a social revolution? What's the business model uh, scale? Uh, uh. Do you do you test it out first, make it free? I mean, they're charging chat GPT three plus 20 bucks a month. And then you got to be waitlisted for the API on four. So is it free? Well, and if Google offers it for free, you got two then, ends of the spectrum, right? Look at Snowflake. What's your table? Look at Snowflake. Yeah. Snowflake is like, they don't make, they don't apologize for it. You got to come in. You want all these benefits? You want all this value? You got to come into our world. That's, you, sorry, this is, you got to come into our house. And once you're here, life will get better for you, but you got to come in here. And so, okay, we'll extend and support open source tooling, but they sell value. You know, Databricks kind of at the other end of the spectrum, which is, hey, we're going to open source it. And, you know, we're going to provide a managed service that allow you to get the most value out of that open source capability. So two different ends of the spectrum. I think they both can succeed. I think so, Google, if I was Google, I would, and if I was advising Sundar Pakai, so anyone listening that works for Google, please pass this up to Sundar. Free. Match, <laughs> match open API, blow to blow, feature for feature, free. 
because Google's free. I mean, they have, they have the scale. And they can afford so, it. And that would be the game changer. I think the one thing that could hurt OpenAI is their charging. And this is a horizontally scalable use case. I would say put it in the hands of everybody and get the data into your cloud, your app, and make it a super app, right? And not be trying to be the web. Because remember, they strip mine the web. So they, they stole from the web. Oh, stole. They borrow. They're using the web. And now they're charging for it. I don't think that connects with the audience, Dave. Like, if, you know, think about that. Open AI borrowed or crawled or whatever word you want to call the web for their large language model. And now they're charging for it. Yeah, well, it's true, but I pay for it. Do you? I do. Yeah, I like this. I, I, I use it every day. I do too. I just did a demo. It takes our really high quality content that we build in some of these video interviews, you know, snippets of them, feed it in. It creates great tweet storms, creates great questions. It answers a lot of questions. It's just such a scalable, heavy lifting tool for us with content. And we're seeing that with podcasts. I mean, it's going to be a media renaissance. You're going to see, you're going to see a lot of things like break and new things emerge on media. The media cloud will be that we've been doing will be a big deal. And I think going to be new players coming in. It's going to be fun. I use it for our, you know, for our, within our media cloud. When I have a guest on and we're ripping and we're all over the place and I get a transcript, I'm like, oh, I got to curate this transcript. I just feed it at the chat CPT. I can give you the top five points of this conversation. Boom, in bullets, bang, I get it back. And then I edit it, because sometimes ChatGPT doesn't get it right. But I know, I was doing the interview. And it's just, it, it cuts my time in half, maybe hey, two thirds. I take your breaking analysis, which by the way, I love. And, and they're big, long reads. They're really, yeah. I mean, you should, we could charge, you should charge for that. I mean, I mean, Gartner would charge like a hundred grand per company for that that content. I feed it into ChatGPT and it gives me a summary. Yeah. It's like modern yeah. data platform issues. By Dave Vellante. So you're, I mean, it's really going to get in this world of, you know, whose contents, who the strip mining game is coming. And you're going to see a lot of bad actors out there, strip mining content producers who are producing proprietary intellectual property. And the question is, where does it go? The web had a nice contract. It's free content and you can choose to put a gate up. I think it should all be free. That's my rant. Yeah. Interesting. All right. Well, we, are we in the rant? Section. Yeah, let's get into the. Let's, we're gonna we got to we got the clock ticking. We got a few minutes left, Dave. So, um, let's get the rants on. So, what's your rant for the week? So, I got the UK Competition Authority is moving forward with an in-depth probe of the sixty-one billion dollar Broadcom VMware uh, deal, and um, you know, look, the Competition Authority of the UK has previously done this, uh, and they've they've allowed things to go through. They gave Broadcom five days to respond. And Broadcom was like, what, five days? Like, how are you going to respond five days for a $61 billion acquisition? They probably hit them up in the week. I mean, it's just ridiculous. This is an example of more government meddling. Uh, and I'm just curious to see if the U.S. is going to pile on like they did with the ARM and, and NVIDIA, which they, the U.S. basically provided no support for that deal, which was, to me, just a ridiculously lost opportunity. And I think actually the opposite is happening as a result of the Broadcom announcement that they're going to acquire VMware. It's creating more competition because it's been a tailwind for Red Hat and Nutanix because customers are saying, hmm, okay, I'm just going to explore some alternatives. Let me go talk to Red Hat. You know, Nutanix has said, hey, we got some migration tools. But at the end of the day, that what, what's going to happen when Broadcom acquires VMware is they're going to, Take that complicated portfolio, which has been kept alive with M and A, and you know have forced integration yep. and you know blah blah blah, and they're going to say, okay, we're going to simplify it, and we're going to focus on those things that matter most. We're an engineering company, and we're going to put engineering resources on those things. And look, if if they raise prices, you know, or not, whatever. Yeah. If the if the customer, if the business case for that customer is to move, the customer is going to move. It's Broadcom's job to make sure that the business case of moving is less attractive than the business case of staying. Yeah. And so, I mean, Broadcom, I, Broadcom is getting bamboozled here by the EU. EU stepping over there out of, out of out of their lane. I'll tell you why I don't like it. One is it's the classic thing, Dave. You look at anyone, you'll find a crime. That's the way, if you stare hard enough at something, you'll have a crime. They have a history. The EU has a history of doing this. In 2001, the EU blocked the GE Honeywell merger. 
yep. 50, it was a $42 billion merger. You factor in inflation, it's about the same kind of number, kind of scope. They made shit up. They had to do all kinds of gyrations, sell this division, do this, all under the guise that it might hurt competition. So that was Jack Wells when he was in his prime and Honeywell, they ended up not doing the deal. So they essentially dragged them through the mud. The clock expired. And it's like, ah, eh, this is, you know, I'm not going to do all these things. And they ended up killing the deal. That was the deal killer for that, yeah. for that merger. So I see the same movie play taking place here. Broadcom is not going to have a monopoly and, and board competition because the market's changed. Look what's happened in the past hundred days. Right. You know? a, a monopoly in what? In VMware? VMware already has a monopoly in VMware. And you're going to give that to Broadcom because, okay, they have CA. I mean, actually, I would say Broadcom's acquisition of CA was good for CA customers because finally you had somebody actually making some investments well, in, the, in in software. Well, there's a, there's a chip hoarding game going on right, right now. So as you know, my rant is that the supply chain blowback is coming. And what you're seeing and what I'm seeing and hearing in Silicon Valley and around the world is all these people, car companies, the Cisco's of the world, they're bogarting the chips, Dave. They're like, yeah, they want them and they're they're placing orders because they got screwed on the last turn so that's kind of that's causing all kinds of forecasting problems on the supply so, so i think there's going to be a real issue with the supply chain over circulation of content a product that's going to actually not be good so that's like again another issue that the eu is going to not understand that there's going to be plenty of opportunity for someone to step in and compete with Broadcom and VMware. So, I, I, and, it's, and, and yet you got all kinds of other competition. So EU is nonsense, um, in my opinion. My, my, Semi, go ahead, sorry. My, my rant, Dave, is quickly, because we don't, I'm, I'm not a time left, is the TikTok thing. I still can't stop thinking about TikTok. Uh -huh. Okay, the, you're seeing a downfall with Twitch a little bit right now. People are leaving, the last founder left, Emma Smear. We've been hearing that um, the leadership there from Amazon um, was, um, you know, there's, there's rumors going around that it's not that great. Creators are leaving. Um, it's still massive numbers. They have Twitch. They got e-commerce at Amazon. I think I think Amazon could take over TikTok better than Oracle. So my rant is I'm really nervous around the bill that came out around regulating and, and cyber, secure, cyber surveillance um, and I think that is a huge problem that we need to wake up to. If we want to be free and, and have liberty, like the United States of America wants, you can't have surveillance state because that's China. So that's my rant. You know, I'm always on that and always thinking about it. So uh, I'm a hawk when it comes to that stuff. Hey, I, I'm well said, John. I'm right there with you. Freedom, baby. All right, Dave, have a great weekend. And uh, for the folks watching, we're going to be at Click World April 18th. I'm going to be in Amsterdam in the EU, but I don't get stopped at the border for that comment. <laughs> 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 that's the guy. He's got a Chinese passport too in there. Um, and then the RSA conference is going to be bit massive. So we got two big events that I'm excited for, Dave. We've got the Cloud Native Conference in Amsterdam. It's the European version. North America is going to be later in the year. And it's going to be very interesting to see the AI impact of that ecosystem because I'm already talking, looking up some, some of the uh, interviews I'm going to be doing there. And the companies involved have an opportunity to use AI and we're seeing use cases and then obviously security use cases is data. So that's another opportunity with AI. So again, I just am so bullish that what we know of today and look at the last hundred days is it, that's a proxy for any tell sign is that the accelerated pace of change starting hundred days ago is already moving. The wave is here. Um, and we're going to see who's going to ride it. I mean, I'm watching everybody. I'm saying people fumble. So people are AI washing. Some people are digging in. So we're going to, this is going to be an ongoing report for us, Dave, AI Madness. So um, we'll keep on that. AI Madness in March, March Madness. All right, Dave, thanks for your time. I know it's late on the East Coast. This Always is Friday. Always a pleasure, John. Great stuff. Yeah, episode nice, six episode. is in the books. Thanks for watching. Let us know what you think and check us out online. I'm at, at Furrier on Twitter. All handles are open on LinkedIn, WhatsApp. Dave Vellante, it's Dave. Thanks for listening.